both here and around the world. So we thank you for your generosity. And Melissa, thank you, and, and thanks especially for, you know, you mentioned, Melissa mentioned about uh, thanking all of you for 4th of July, but I mean, thank you, Melissa, because you, you helped organize the whole thing and, and recruit the volunteers and all of that, and, and, uh, and you were the one sweating it out the most when it was raining hard, and <laughs> we were wondering, what are we going to do with 400 hot dogs if, if nobody comes? Well, we'll have a hot dog eating contest, right? You know, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, it was, a, it was a great, great time and a great way just to be able to say to the community, hey, we're here, we, we love you, we care. Well, today we're, we're wrapping up this, this topical series we've been in for a while on just some of the, the issues, the struggles, the problems that people have uh, with, with God, with the Bible, uh, with the Christian faith. And, and for me, the, um, the sort of loose jumping off point to be framing the questions was this little book that some of us have been reading this summer called The Seven Big Questions. And, um, and among the questions that, that uh, he raises in this book and that we've talked about, um, you know, why does God allow pain and suffering? Um, is there purpose to life? And last week when we looked at, is, is the Bible reliable? Well, he ends the book with a different kind of question, but I think it's one that a lot of people wonder about, and it's the question, can I know God personally, right? And for some people, I think this arises because they have such a sense of guilt and shame, like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm such a horrible person. Why would God ever want, you know, to know me? Uh, you know, for myself, there's a little bit of that maybe, but, but it's more just, just trying to wrap my head around this thing. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up in, in church, and it was, it was my end of my senior year of high school. I first began to kind of hear people talking about Christian things. I began to think about myself, you know, you know boy, is this, this God thing even real, you know? And, and I would hear people talk about, you know, having a personal relationship with God or with Jesus. And to me, that just sounded really um, strange, <laughs> you know? It sounded like, you know, when, when you're little kids and you have imaginary friends, <laughs> Um, because, again, at this point, I'm still just trying to figure out if God is real. But it, but it was obvious to me, okay, if God is real, well, he's, he's God. And he's as different from, from me and, and, and so much greater than me as, as I am different from and greater than like a chipmunk, you know. And he's even more different from me than I am from a chipmunk. And so, so what is this knowing God, God personally uh, thing. And, and even today, you know, as a, as a follower of Jesus who believes this, I find it a whole lot easier to tell you what I believe about Jesus or, or the ways I'm challenged to obey him. A lot easier to talk to you about that than to talk about my, my love for him, right? But I want more, you know? I, I want something more than just to have some you know, good theology and a set of ethics for how to live and, and to know that, okay, God is real and, and a long time ago he walked the earth in this person, Jesus, you know? I mean, I, I, want, to, I want to know that, that, that I can connect with him, that when I talk to him in prayer that he listens, sometimes talks back, you know? I mean, I, I want to to know God as accessible, as relational, as personal, right? Like, like you know a good friend. The question is, though, is that even possible? Well, I'm convinced, yes, it is possible. We, we can know God personally. However, however, this side of heaven, we're always gonna, we're always gonna long for more because only then uh, will, will that relationship be, be full and complete. Well, the passage I want us to attend to is one we usually look at in, in other situations. Uh, it is in Paul's letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's uh, hear God's word. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, and, 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 and pause there, context, if you read the last chapter in 1 Corinthians, it's all about spiritual gifts because the Corinthians were really into spiritual gifts, especially they were into the gift of speaking in tongues. And we could have a whole other series of sermons just on that. But, uh, uh, but, but the point for this one I really want you to catch is that, that what's going on in chapter 13 is he's contrasting from chapter 12 uh, the way of, of spiritual giftedness versus the way of, of love, okay? And, um, and, and by the way, the last line in chapter 12, he says, you know, after he's talked all about spiritual gifts, he says, now I'm going to show you the more excellent way. 
And he talks all about love in the chapter we read a lot at weddings. Although whenever a couple asks me to, to read that at a wedding, I always try to tell them, I say, you know, this was not written for lovers. <laughs> this was written to a whole church load of people who were fighting with each other and couldn't get along, which probably makes it a great text for a wedding. Because <laughs> sometimes in marriage, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of like that. There are seasons that are, that are like that. Well, here we go. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have to get to prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And here, here's where I want us to really zone in. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man... I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Well, the contrast that Paul is, is drawing here is between that which is, is in part and that which is, is complete. And, and so, you know, when he says here, but when completeness comes, he's talking about a future time, time when Christ returns and ushers in a new heaven and new earth. That's will be when completeness comes, contrasting that with what is in part, what's only for, for this age. And his overall point here is that that gifts, like prophecy and speaking in tongues and the rest, that these are just for, for this age. Now, I do believe that there are some Christian circles where they do an overcorrection on this and say that, yeah, the gifts are not, uh, we, we don't need them anymore. Uh, maybe they don't even operate anymore. If they do, maybe they're, they're demonic, okay? Especially gifts like, like prophecy and speaking in tongues. And, and, and they say this not because, well, now we've fully grasped this way of love, <laughs> But, but usually because, well, now we have really developed theology. Now we have the Bible, and so we don't need that stuff. I think Paul would say, no, no, these, these, these things are for this age. These gifts are for this age. These are things that can help people come to faith, can help people grow in their faith. And, and if you think about it with gifts today that we're more familiar with, um, I, I would never claim to be, you know, the greatest of preachers. But if I didn't have even, you know, just a little bit of giftedness in what Scripture calls exhortation, you know, the church would not be, be helped, would not be, be built up, right? Now, in heaven, we're not going to have preachers. That doesn't, well, I think I'll be in heaven, but I won't be, be doing what I'm doing now, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but we won't need preachers, right? We won't need that. Because it's, preaching is only for, for this age. And Paul's point, though, is that even now, though, even in this age, that, that without love, the kind of love he talks about here, that's patient, that's kind, that's all of that stuff, Without that, the greatest preaching in the world gets you nothing. It gets you nothing. It's, it's, it's like a, a clanging gong or a ringing cymbal, right? Well, backtracking through here. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. And I love one commentator. He gives a picture of this. He says, it's kind of like when the sun comes up, if your porch light is on, you don't even notice it. It's like it's disappeared, right? You don't need it anymore. 
When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. And his point there is not, as I've heard some say, it's not about being childish. It's more just comparing the difference between our, our present state and, and the future new creation. And then, then the real money verse here. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. And um, I, I love this, this, this rendition, and this is the new NIV translation here. Uh, the old NIV, which is the Pew Bibles that you have, 1984 version, it says, uh, now we see a poor reflection. Um, the one you might be more familiar with is, now we see in a mirror dimly. Um, to, to me, those are, are, are more pejorative. They suggest that, that he says, well, what's, what, what you see in the mirror, it's bad or it's distorted. But I don't think that's really what Paul is saying at all. His point is not that it's bad, it's that it's incomplete, right? It's only reflection. It's not, it's not face-to-face. See, Corinth was, was famous in the ancient world for its bronze work. And in that day, mirrors were made of polished bronze, not, not of glass. And, and the mirrors, as mirrors go, they were really good mirrors. They were really good. Uh, they, were, they were famous for these things, right? But looking at somebody in a mirror is never, never quite as good as, as looking at them face-to-face, or think about looking at your own face. The only way you're ever going to see your own face, this side of heaven, is, is in a mirror, right? <laughs> but, but notice what he says. He says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. In other words, even as, as we're known by God. Now, God knows us that way now. But someday he's saying, you know, we're going to know ourselves and we're going to know each other that way too. You know, fully, completely. But for now, <laughs> for now... You know, we see a reflection in a mirror. This is how we can, can see God now in the present age. And I think if Paul were, were writing this today, uh, he, he might have said, now we see like in a, in a photograph or a picture, but then face to face. And a lot of us find that very disappointing because <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't feel very, very personal, does it? <laughs> you know? But, but, but think about it like this. You know, today... Uh, my wife Amy is not here. She is with my, my oldest uh, daughter and, and grandson, and they're in Florida visiting with our son and his wife um, in their home there. And, and I, I kind of miss them, and, uh, and I, I'm a little bit envious because I kind of wish that, you know, I, I could actually be there the way she is. But she, you know, she sends me texts and gives me phone calls, and she sends me pictures, like she sent me this picture the other day, what they're doing. Isn't that great? That's my little grandson and his mom in the background, and that makes me even more envious, you know? It's like, boy, how come I'm, how come I'm not there? Um, now, is, is, is that as good, getting pictures, is that as good as being able to actually be with them and see their faces and give them hugs, you know? No, of course not. But it's still pretty good. And it, it kind of keeps me going until, until tomorrow uh, when, you know, when I'm going to see them again. Or, or maybe a better example of this would be how, you know, a lot of people today meet their wives or their husbands online. They meet them online. The first, the first encounters, I mean, it's, it's electronic words and pictures that you're exchanging, Right. But, but as, these, you know, as, as you're, you're, you're doing that, exchanging those, this longing grows to kind of meet face-to-face, right? But even before then, even before you meet face-to-face, especially even before you know, your, your marriage is, is, is consummated, it's made complete, well before then, you're still you, you're growing a relationship with that person, aren't you? And it's real. It's real, even though you haven't seen them face-to-face. Well, because God is a living person, And we can especially recognize this because of when in history, he entered history as a human person, the person Jesus. We can come to know him in person, even if right now, not in a face-to-face way. And it's practices, it's habits like prayer and reading and reflecting in scripture and being in community that that become like the mirrors or the pictures through which we can get to know God now. And uh, I, I, I often talk about those habits and practices, and, and if you want me to, I'll, I can do that. Um, but, but for today, rather than really, really flesh these out some more, I, I want to just clarify that there's a fundamental um, you know, decision and real posture toward God that's just so essential for even getting to first base 
in terms of a relationship with him. And, and Jesus summed this up with two words. <laughs> Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Now, repentance, that's not a very elegant word, is it? Um, but repentance, I think, doesn't mean what we often think it means. You know, repentance you know, does, is not about you know, pretending, we think, or actually thinking that you know, we're, we're really bad and we're really sorry for that. <laughs> Repentance isn't most fundamentally uh, even about you know, changing our behavior with respect to our sins, though, though it includes a willingness to do that, knowing that we're going to fail a lot in doing that. Repentance, friends, most fundamentally is this. It is recognizing and renouncing your trust in everything and everybody else except for God for your hope, for your significance, for your security. And it includes renouncing even your trust in your good moral behavior for these things, right? Because if you're going to look to Jesus and trust him to be your savior, you got to recognize that you can't save yourself. And for a lot of us, that recognition, that's, that's even more challenging than just you know, trying to give up a bad habit or two. Because we are just so so conditioned to looking to other things, especially looking uh, to ourselves, you know, our gifts, our abilities, our willpower, you know, to save us and and to make us feel like we we matter, you know. And so repentance, it's, it's saying a big no to all of that. And believing, believing or trusting in Jesus. Now, there's a specific content to our believing. It's in Jesus, in Jesus Christ who he is as God, who he is as Savior because of what he's done in history to show himself to be those things. And it's also trusting in what he promises to someday in the future bring about to to return and to make everything, including us, as we we should be. And it's not just believing these things in our heads, right? It's, It's actually trusting that it's in relationship with him that I find my security, my my significance, my salvation. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, my faith, my trust, and probably yours is, is, is not very strong. Um, you know, it's, it's weak. It's chock full of questions and doubts. That's okay. That's okay. The most important thing, friends, is not the strength of your faith or your trust, but it's the strength and the trustworthiness of the one in whom you've put your trust. You focus on him, focus on Jesus, the object of your faith, and your faith, your trust in him, it'll, it'll grow, it really will. Repenting and believing, it's something we do definitively in a moment in time, and it's something that we, we, we reinforce and live into over and over and over and over again. It's, it's kind of like being married, you know, it, it happens in a moment in time when you stand up in front of God and your friends and your family and you make a promise, you know, that I'm going to love, honor, and cherish you till death do his part. But being married is really about uh, living that promise out. You know, day after day, year after year, decade after decade, right? And with repenting and believing the soil in which we live these out, it's in community with other people in church because it's in community with each other that we learn and practice what Paul is calling this more excellent way, right? This, this way of love. And, and, and notice, you know, what he doesn't say about love. He doesn't say love is romantic. Love makes you feel, oh, you know, <laughs> love is sexy, now, there's a dimension of love that, that, that is about that. But Paul's talking about something very different here, isn't he? And he's talking about something that's accessible for, that's, it, it's not just for, you know, for the, the, the artsy-feely types of people, okay? What he's talking about here is love is also for the very you know, left-brain accountants and engineers among us too, right? And though it's not Paul's main point in 1 Corinthians 13, I think he would agree that when it comes to knowing God, that that is going to be more vivid and more personally real to people, the more, the more that this kind of love he's talking about just permeates the atmosphere. In his chapter on knowing God personally, um, Bruce Miller, he, he quotes uh, this, this other fellow who I didn't know who he was, but somebody after the first service told me who he is, a pastor in New York City, John Tyson. The church, when it's working properly, 
gives people a tangible encounter of what it feels like to be loved by Jesus. Isn't that good? You dwell, dwell on that one for a bit. Now, some people are going to get this knowing God personally thing better than others. Just like, you know, for some people, they, they, they feel more, more connected to other people in their, their human relationships as well. And with any personal relationship, but I think especially a relationship with God, there, there's just an element of mystery to it that you really can't, can't quite, you know, put, put into words. But friends, I'm convinced that God is, is personal. He especially demonstrated that in Jesus. And though Jesus no longer uh, walks the earth, he's a real living person. Someday he's going to actually return to planet earth in the flesh, you know, as our, our reigning king. But until then, and meanwhile, he's in the world today by means of this mysterious person we call the Holy Spirit, Right? And knowing him now as a person begins with and is sustained by our repenting and believing. And especially repenting and believing in the context of, of a community with each other. It's marked by, by this love thing, right? And a place where all these things come together and where I find that God often meets people in a very personal way is, is at the communion table, Right? Because the communion table is a place of repentance. We, we come to it knowing that we can't save ourselves and that our security, our significance is not in our good behavior or our good looks or our talents and our abilities and our achievements or any of that stuff. You know, it, it's, it's all wrapped up in the fact that God considers you and me worth the life of his son. Community table is also a place where we're reminded of the core of what we believe and whom we trust. Jesus, who bled and died for us. Jesus, who rose from the dead for us. And Jesus, who someday is going to return and is going to make all things new. And it's a place where we come together. We come together as, as a people growing in our capacity to love. Because we're motivated by and we're, we're witnessing to the one who demonstrated that love by freely giving his life. So that like him, we too could become sons and daughters of his father. Well, let's, um, let's now prepare ourselves to come to this table.